So rhodiola rosea is a really interesting compound because it falls into this category of what people call adaptogens. But normally when you hear adaptogens, first of all, that's a very vague term. It doesn't yeah. actually mean anything specific. It means a, an ability to adapt generally or specifically. No one's really pinpointed what that means. But typically the adaptogens are going to reduce cortisol. So for instance, ashwagandha is a very potent suppressor of cortisol. There's some evidence it can indirectly in increase testosterone, but probably mm -hmm. through suppression of cortisol, since those are in the same synthesis pathway. Ashwagandha is an adaptogen. Ashwagandha, because it lowers cortisol, should probably be taken late day, not early day, because you want cortisol high. Yep. Ashwagandha, as a cortisol suppressing adaptogen, probably also should not be taken in high amounts, not low, low amounts, but in high amounts, meaning you know four to 600 milligrams prior to exercise, because the whole goal of exercise is to trigger the adaptation through a spike in cortisol, mm -hmm. or one of the goals. Rhodiola rosea is a very interesting compound because it's an adaptogen in that it greatly reduces perceived effort and allows for greater power output and endurance output, as you pointed out a moment ago. But it does not do that by suppressing cortisol. So 200 milligrams of rhodiola rosea prior to say a resistance training workout, or even on one of your uh, ski touring days, you will notice you have more vigor. You can just go longer and your perceived effort is much lower. And it's kind of striking. What is it doing? Now, this is interesting. It's kind of striking how after the workout, you don't feel as depleted. That perhaps the main reason I started taking it is I found I could train harder, but then I suffered quite a lot from a post-exercise dip in energy, especially if I ate big meal. I no longer experience that if I take rhodiola rosea I'm 30 to 60 minutes before workout. The effects of it last about four hours. So what's happening during that workout? It's clearly having an effect on the central nervous system by reducing the total amount of adrenaline that's released or the efficacy of adrenaline, epinephrine, during high intensity effort or long duration effort. So what this effectively means is you're, in principle, one is able to generate the same amount of effort without the same amount of energy depleting neurochemicals. I mean, epinephrine, norepinephrine help you generate energy, but there's always a trough afterwards, mm -hmm. always. And so if you can generate the same amount of physical output in the absence of X amount of adrenaline or norepinephrine, then you're essentially better off. It also seems to catalyze recovery better. I would not take it more often than just before training, however, because there are a few studies showing that the effects of it can kind of taper off if you're taking it all day, every day. Now, would that be true for, say, ashwagandha? Let's just say someone's taking it before sleep. Would they want to cycle off of that? How would you think about cycling if recommended? Yeah. Low dose of ashwagandha, you know, 25, 50 milligrams a day, taken continuously, no problem. I actually think AG1 has low dose of ashwagandha in it. But when people are taking ashwagandha to offset high stress of, you know, mental or physical stuff or both for a period in life, I'd say after about two weeks, you want at least two weeks off. Mm -hmm. You really don't want to suppress cortisol chronically unless there's some clinical reason for that. Yeah. Rhodiola rosea is probably the best addition to my kind of physical performance stack that, mm -hmm. I, that I've added in a long time. And it's really striking. I mean, I think so much so that people could try it and it really does seem to work the first time and every time hmm. for me. If it doesn't work for you the first time, if you, you know, all other things being equal, you got a decent night's sleep, you're doing everything the same way you normally would, and you take rhodiola rosea and you don't really notice much of an effect, you know, it, you might try and increase the dose slightly and, and give it another go. And what was the dosage range? 200 or? milligrams. 200 milligrams. Yeah, is what I'll take. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be really striking. Now, I'm not going to take that before like, like a long Sunday jog or a hike. I mean, I might, but chances are I'm not going to. I'm going to do it before a leg workout. I'm going to do it before a hit workout. I'm mainly doing it to make sure that I can train really hard and then go do other things really hard too. Mm -hmm. Again, as not a competitive athlete, I loathe the experience of training really hard and then feeling like I gave everything to that training session. And therefore, I don't have much energy or focus to give to the other things. Anything else? Yeah. yeah. And I think most people are like that. Are you still taking the Tonkat Ali and the Fedosia Agrestis? And for those who are not familiar, because I think we may have made mention of this in our last conversation, but just in brief, what do these two things do? Tonkat Ali is an Indonesian ginseng. 
There's a Malaysian version too, but you want the Indonesian one if you want to pursue these effects, which are, it's known to decrease sex hormone binding globulin, which frees testosterone, Mm -hmm. which is important in both men and women. It turns out in women, there's more testosterone circulating in a healthy woman, post-puberty woman, than there is estrogen. Peter Atia taught me this. If you normalize for nanograms per deciliter, women have more testosterone than estrogen. Healthy women do. Hmm. So testosterone is associated with libido, ability and desire to generate effort, mood, et cetera, in men and women. Probably the best way to describe testosterone's effects are it makes effort feel good. Mm -hmm. So um, Tonga Ali frees up more testosterone. So mild libido enhancer for some, more extreme for others. Increases energy, increase, you know, feelings of well-being. And typically the dosages are 400 milligrams a day in single dose or divide doses with or without food taken early in the day before noon or 2 p.m. because it can increase energy. You don't want to disrupt your sleep. There are a number of good sources of it. We can provide links to a couple of those sources. And Fidogia agressus is a Nigerian shrub. It's taken from a Nigerian shrub and it stimulates the release of luteinizing hormone, Mm -hmm. which is going to come out of the pituitary. And in women will stimulate anything that comes from downstream of luteinizing hormone in the ovary, so typically estrogen, maybe even testosterone to some extent. And in men, it will increase testosterone output from the testes by way mm. of increasing luteinizing hormone, maybe subtle increase in estrogen as well. This is important. Men hear that something increases estrogen, and they go, oh, I don't want that. Well, keep in mind that if you flatline your estrogen, so if men are taking an astrazole or crushing their estrogen, their libido is going to be zero. Yeah their cognitive ability will be diminished. Estrogen yeah. is important in both men and also women. Also cardioprotective, isn't it? Cardioprotective. The endothelial cells, we think of our blood vessels and our arteries and capillaries as tubes, but they're really tubes. Imagine silly putty kind of rolled out, Play-Doh made into little flat sheets and then rolled up to comprise those tubes. So it's many, many endothelial cells that make up those tubes. And the flexibility of those tubes is very important. Obviously, you don't want them rigid. You need them to expand and contract as needed. and Estrogen is important for, for some of that signaling leading to that malleability of the endothelial cells. Fidogia agrestis is typically taken in dosages of 300 to 600 milligrams per day with or without food. doesn't seem to matter if it's early day, late day. There's some evidence that in rats, it can be toxic to the testicular tissue, but that's in very, very high concentrations. And the, it's interesting, the, the number of studies on humans for both Tonga Ali and Fidoja have greatly expanded since our last conversation. Mm-hmm. And especially for Tonga Ali, there's quite good support. Safety margins are good within the dosage ranges that we've talked about. I've heard of people taking up to a gram a day of Tonga Ali. That just makes me cringe. I think taking herbal compounds in very high concentrations, is going to be risky no matter what, because these things can trigger immune responses. So, you know, 400 milligrams of Tonga Ali, 300, 600 milligrams of Fidogia taken daily should be fine. I don't cycle them and never have. Some people cycle the Fidogia because Why they're afraid. Not? Why don't I cycle them? Yeah, because they I mean, just I'm, keep working. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, Louis Simmons right. could have said that about right. <laughs> anabolics well, too. <laughs> yeah, so a couple of reasons. I do blood work twice a year. Yeah, Liver enzymes are included there. Uh-huh. We can talk about fertility perhaps it, if you want today, in the last year, because of my age and the fact that I don't have children yet, but I'm cognizant of the fact that I do want them at some point, I started doing, I got really down the rabbit hole, interesting figure of speech, of <laughs> sperm analysis, including everything from DNA fragmentation to how to increase sperm numbers and motility and quality and egg quality. I so got, you're a gambling man. If you're yeah. making your swimmers world class, but yeah. you don't want kids. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Well, it's all about readiness, I suppose. <laughs> What is it that in the SEAL teams they say? Like you, you fall not to the level of your, of your hope, but to the you, level you of your not, preparation? You, yeah. you do not rise to the level of your hopes, but fall to the level of your preparation. That's actually a quote from Archilochus, who is a mm-hmm. Greek poet and I believe philosopher also. But yes, but, also widely used in the special forces teams. Yeah. So I've been monitoring sperm parameters, freezing sperm, because I might want to do IVF someday with somebody, you know, this kind of thing, or have conceived naturally. But and because yeah, we're talking about tools, supplements, et cetera, as it relates to vitality and fertility, I think there is a way to optimize for both of those things. Mm-hmm. So I don't cycle them because I haven't felt a need to or seen okay. a need to. Some people choose to just take a week off from Fredoji every once in a while or go five days on, two days off. You know, people should do what makes them comfortable. 
Males will notice an effect of Fidogia. It actually will increase testicular size somewhat and a density. Mm-hmm. And that's just because of the increase of the LH luminizing hormone so is going to stimulate like avocado them. pits. <laughs> <laughs> just hanging between it, the legs. It's going to depend on where you start. <laughs>